So hello, um, thank you for being here. So I'm going to, ah, uh, there's my title. Basically I'm gonna like break down through all the, the long big words in my title and explain to you a little bit about the ways that science fiction informs my, my research uh, and science informs my research and also about some of the kind of invisible influences, uh, one of which I think is science fiction itself. All right, so uh, the first part of my title, True Life. Uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting to think about the research I do in technoculture and science fiction under this rubric of invisible influences is how much um, science fiction and life sort of interpenetrate one another. Uh, and this seems to be increasingly the case as we move into the 21st century. In fact, science fiction writers, uh, they're often lamenting these days that it's very much more difficult to write science fiction than it used to be, that the future keeps catching up with science fiction. And so, you know, what are we to do? We have to keep setting our stories nearer and nearer to the future because we really don't have any idea uh, what the consequences of technological changes might be in just even five or 10, 15 years from now. So to work through some of my images here, one of the points I really want to stress to you is that although science fiction um, often seems kind of schlocky and particularly the genre got its name from pulp magazines that started, uh, a magazine that was started in 1926 by this guy named Hugo Gernsbach. Uh, the Gernsbach, or sorry, the Hugo Awards are named for him, so if you've heard of the Hugo Awards, that's where they get their name. So he actually, the first title he came up with was CNT Fiction, but nobody could pronounce it and nobody could spell it, so eventually that became science fiction. And the covers of these magazines, and indeed many of the stories within them, uh, seem very far-fetched. They involved a lot of like insect creatures uh, menacing pretty young women. There was a lot of dashing around space in that Star Wars space opera kind of way. Uh, and there were things like the photo you see at the side there of uh, War of the Worlds, uh, these Martians in their tripods coming to attack Earth which is based on an H.G. Wells novel, War of the Worlds, um, the images themselves incline us not to take this genre very seriously, that it just seems like good adventure fun. But of course, War of the Worlds was also, uh, at the time it was written in the late 19th century, a critique of British colonialism and the uh, sort of the stunning innovation of War of the Worlds in its time was that it imagined Britain not being the agent of imperial occupation, but rather being the victim of imperial occupation by the Martians. And he makes direct comparisons to some of the things that were um, happening in the British Empire. Uh, so sort of, sort of leaping rapidly ahead to become more contemporary with the sort of things that I want to talk about tonight. Uh, the images at the bottom there, one at the side with the mouse with the ear growing on its back, seems like a very science fictional image, it seems very lurid like these covers, uh, but indeed is research that's actually ongoing of trying to uh, use genomic technology to develop um, uh, skin replacements and other kind of prostheses. So that's sort of skin growing over a piece of plastic on a mouse's back to create a sort of ear implant for humans. The other thing, the two pictures of the goats up there, one just looks like an ordinary goat being milked, but the other looks again like lurid science fiction. Um, they're both spider goats, and I sort of have them both up there to stress sort of partly how this imagination works. That the lurid image catches our attention much more than the ordinary goat being milked, but the ordinary goat being milked has had its genome modified so that it secretes a protein in its milk that is related to the protein that forms silk and spiders, and then they manufacture um, something called biosteel from that protein. So again, it sort of looks like science fiction, but it indeed is science. Next slide, please. Uh, so all of this is situated in uh, what most of my work is um, located in, which is a discourse called posthumanism. And all my little points up there in the slide are to sort of help you see this, the two kinds of um, aspects or angles of posthumanism. So one part of posthumanism is kind of fantasies of being post-human embodiment, post the limitations of human embodiment, and we have a lot of science fiction, and indeed groups such as the transhumanists um, who invest in this fantasy and are actively working to do things like Imagine what it would be like if we didn't have to sleep, or imagine what it would be like if we could augment our memory, or imagine what it would be like if instead of having to like tediously learn another language, we could like go to sleep and program ourselves through some computer interface with our brain, and then we would know another language. 
But the sort of second half of posthumanism and where my research comes in is sort of also investigating being posthumanism as a philosophical discourse and indeed looking at some of the sort of historical ways that that discourse has excluded certain homo sapiens who didn't count as hu human. Um, so even though it's things like, you know, uh, all men are created equal. It's like, what about women? What about slaves who weren't part of the men being created equal? And so again, science fiction can kind of investigate both uh, this more technological side of things, but also the social side of things. Next slide, please. And the framework that I'm working on most recently and uh, is an invisible influence I wanted to draw your attention to in terms of this biotech research uh, is a term that um, a legal theorist named Sheila Jasonoff came up with, and her term uh, she calls bioconstitutionalism. And the invisible influence that I want to draw your attention to here is the ways that the sort of uh, ongoing research in genomics and other kinds of research and body modification is intersecting with a legal context, and a legal context that comes out of humanism and kind of liberalism, uh, and is the framework where we get things like human rights. Uh, how those two don't really mesh up anymore, and what are some of the consequences of those two things not really meshing up. And so the ways that they don't really mesh up have to do with things like uh, we may go around with this idea that we own our own bodies and that, you know, uh, the parts of our bodies, we get to have the absolute say over what, are, what is done with them. Uh, but the actual reality of a number of legal decisions and precedents is that when our bodies intersect with sort of the biomedical apparatus and any tissue is removed from our bodies, um, that's considered abandoned tissue in this legal discourse and we don't have any rights to say what me might be done with it and we also don't have any financial say or um, right to any profit that might be generated from it. And you might be wondering like what profit could be generated from abandoned tissue, but as it turns out there's quite a lot that might be. Next slide please. So the example I'm going to talk to you about is um, a cell line that's called HeLa. And the reason it's called HeLa is because it's the first two uh, letters of the first name and the surname of the woman whose body this um, cell tissue line was originally cultivated from, Henrietta Lacks. Uh, and you may well have heard of Henrietta Lacks. In the last five or six years, she's become well known. Uh, her case has been popularized uh, largely by um, the book that's up there, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. But prior to that, for about 50 or 60 years, uh, she was an invisible influence at the center of biotech research, uh, but her name was not known, and indeed her family did not know that tissue taken from uh, a cell, she had a um, cervical cancer tumor, uh, which she died from, uh, from all accounts in quite a bit of pain. Uh, she died from this cervical cancer tumor in 1951. Meanwhile, a culture taken from that tumor was the first successful human tissue culture uh, to be sustained, uh, as it turns out, indefinitely. Uh, but at the, initially, it was just sustained for a considerable ter period of time. But this tissue is still living today, whereas Henrietta Lacks is long since dead. And it is only recently that her family was made aware of the fact that her, these cells taken from their mother's body were still living. And indeed, um, millions and millions of dollars of profit in the biotech industry have been made from experiments conducted based on this tissue sample and um, all the cells that, that, that have been cultivated from it since. So Henrietta Lacks' tissue has been involved in everything from developing the vaccine for polio. Her tissue's been up in space because they wanted to see what weightlessness, what kind of effect that would have on tissue growth. Uh, her tissue has been subject to all kinds of radiation blasts because they wanted to see uh, what, you know, how bad would a nuclear war actually be? What does it look like when you radiate tissue? Uh, and it's also been in involved in in many other kinds of vaccines and drug developments since. Um, and her family, uh, needless to say, was quite upset when they found out about this. Uh, and then, much later, it was also revealed that because her cells grow so, so successfully, uh, in fact, her tissue had contaminated a number of other tissue cultures in the biotech industry, which were thought to be other kinds of tissue, and so as well as generating millions and millions of dollars of profit, Henrietta Lacks has actually cost um, millions and millions of dollars of wasted research, and her family feels that that is sort of like her revenge for the failure to give consent to what was doing for her tissue um, uh, and uh, their lack of a share in the profits. 
So the other picture I have up there is um, her son and his two daughters, so her two granddaughters. And one of the reasons I put sort of both those pictures up there is I wanted to draw attention to, and, and this is, I think, something that science fiction research does, it restores a kind of fuller human context to some of the questions that come up in science. And the sort of post-human question here is, you know, where is or who is Henrietta Lacks? Um, the individual is dead and, and buried since 1951, but this tissue is still alive. So like, what's the relationship between that tissue and this family? And much as the cells are still alive, she's also still alive in sort of her descendants and her family. And so that's two sort of different ways to theorize and trace um, notions of immortality or notions of continuity. And science fiction is a kind of a site where those two things can come together and you can restore this sort of sociological and human context to uh, the implications of biotech research. Next slide, please. So um, one of the sort of key arguments I'm making here today then is that science fiction is this invisible influence um, on the, the cultures of science and also of, on our everyday understandings of everything from what it means to be human to um, sort of what the implications of research are, how we feel about them, whether or not the public decides to support research or not. And the cover of this um, magazine here, again, I'm trying to draw attention to this contrast between the luridness of the image, uh, a kind of context people don't necessarily take seriously, but the very real concerns. So that's sort of how to build your own uh, family foxhole at the bottom there, the nuclear war concerns. Next slide. Uh, so here's a few examples you may or may not know of. Um, and this is about the sort of way that science fiction has sort of invisibly penetrated our popular imagination. So the Strategic Defense Initiative, or as it was popularly known, Star Wars, so it really draws attention to those con that connection. I mean, not only was it inspired by this kind of idea drawn from a science fiction film, but the book on the other part of the slide there, Mutually Assured Survival, was produced by a group of science fiction writers, fans, and um, some scientists who uh, were actually advising President Reagan that they were a think tank for imagining future scenarios and um, developing, having an influence on developing foreign policy, including the SDI. Next slide. Uh, this one's a very obvious one, but that one of the space shuttles was named Enterprise because of Star Trek being named Enterprise, uh, I think goes to show the way that science fiction and its visions of imagining a future in space led to popular public support for the space program. Next slide. Uh, cyberspace also famously inspired both by uh, William Gibson's Neuromancer and then things like Second Life inspired by Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. Both of these, uh, there's lots of research documenting how they were sort of like handed out in Silicon Valley firms and told like this is what we're working towards. Next slide. Uh, and so the final example I want to talk about is a, a science fiction film called Transfer uh, by a um, Serbian, no, Croatian, I'm sorry, Croatian director who lives in Germany, um, which draws attention to some of these issues about the sort of legal um, situation of uh, organ transplants and body tissues and the ownership situation that's set up around that. Uh, so Transfer is a film that takes this and sort of imagine it, imagines it in weird science fictional settings like the spider with the goat's head on it, but is talking about a real kind of context in which tissues are being moved from some bodies to other bodies and that there's these um, socioeconomic consequences of the way that this is structured, much like Henrietta Lacks' family um, saw no profit from any of the things done with her cells and indeed one of their complaints that is repeated often is that they couldn't even afford health care for the things that were wrong with them. And so this sort of radical separation between the human side of these bodies that are commodified and the legal context in which uh, profit is going to these firms. So next slide. So as I'm going to talk a little bit about what the film does, this is just a trailer of it from, from YouTube. Uh, it's all in German, which is why you have no sound. But it's about a situation in which the older German couple that you see there, Hermann and Anna, they're aging, they've been in love all their lives, they don't want to be alone, and Anna gets sick and they're, they're very, very wealthy. So they go to Manzana Corporation and they take advantage of this great thing that Manzana Corporation offers them, which is that they can have their minds transplanted into the bodies of um, African people who have sold their bodies in order to support their families. 
Uh, and so the African people, they're, they're still in the bodies as well. They have to take these pills so that the African people are sequestered for all but four hours of the day. Uh, and then these um, rich white people get the, the use of new and young bodies and don't have to die again. And this film is drawing attention to a real context in which things like organ transplants are happening in which people are selling kidneys to support their family because they don't have any other commodities that they can bring to market. And it's something that a medical anthropologist called Nancy Shepherd Hughes calls late modern cannibalism. And so my argument about the sort of invisible influence of science fiction and the importance of science fiction for thinking about these kinds of things is that in taking these really kind of abstract concepts about tissues and immort immortal tissues and cell lines growing and organ transplants and all these other kinds of things that are difficult to understand or the legal context of who owns the rights to tissue samples, but putting it in a story with characters with whom we can identify and we see their real life struggles, that this is a way that science fiction can help us understand these issues and also can help us understand them in a way that is not divorced from um, things such as ethics, things such as politics, things such as socioeconomic implications, which science is it's presented often in a sort of um, strictly research venue, has to sort of strip those things out. And so this is why I think that science fiction functions as a kind of supplement to science. It loves science, it embraces uh, the things science is doing, but it also reminds us that science has a con consequences in the world for real people and that we need to deal with these issues. So thank you for your attention.